Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode 12 of Let's Play Creatures Such As We with Trillian. I'm Trillian, and you're wonderful. Thank you for being here. Um, we're all fucked. <laughs> Let's click it. They take the news better than you expected. James looks contemplatively out into space. Saudry and Diana just stare at you, mouths agape. Grant nods and smiles meekly to mask his mounting panic. Wren, strangely enough, seems completely unaffected. Andres attempts to get control of the situation by blustering at you. Now, hold on a minute. If there are meteors falling on us, isn't going outside the worst thing we could do? I think we should stay right here and wait it out. You can almost see the mutiny in his eyes. They are going to revolt, and then the whole emergency is going to be painted as your fault. But you still have a chance to reassert control of the situation. You focus on allaying their fears. This reminds me of something that came up in Doctor Who recently. I think the doctor told Clara, like, they're going to look for a leader. You make sure you're it. <laughs> a group naturally seeks a leader. Make sure you're it. Um, okay. The meteoroid warning has passed. Uh, I think is just confusing. Like, I'm not sure if it's true. And if it's true, then they're going to be like, then why are we evacuating? It's just bleh. It's actually much safer in a suit than a building. Maybe true, but let's not devolve into arguing about details with these people because that's just going to take it all. That's not how you take charge. It's the fastest way to get you home. Is also about details. Now is not the time to argue. That's how you take charge. Don't argue with me. I'm in charge. You're a guest. <laughs> Stay with the procedures. This prompts James into channeled action. Actually, now is exactly the time to argue. We can't just assume that what you're telling us is best. You need someone to check your facts. <laughs> really, James? I think if I were, like, what's the equivalent? On a yacht or something? I would trust the, the stewards and the captain and everybody to get me off the ship. Wren fixes you with an over-the-glasses stare. James gets upset sometimes, but I agree with him. For now, though, James, can you find any flaw in this path? If not, let's go along with it. James scowls at Wren, but he doesn't voice any specific objections. That's a relief. You slide back into your smiling, assertive stance and solidify your authority. Great, then. It's settled. We will make the walk over to Space Joy's Moon Base 12. Sadre speaks up. Yes, but what about the workers here? Do they not get to evacuate? Um, as guests, you're our first priority. Yeah. I, I don't know what's happening to them, honestly. But that's not my job. My job is to deal with you. Marcel's job is to deal with them. This seems to satisfy Saudry, who mumbles out and, Oh, okay, I, I can see that. You expected more of an argument, but then you suspect that she doesn't really want to question her privilege too deeply. At least she had the presence to ask. You heard them with outstretched hands. Let's start making our way to the suit room. We'll have to take an auxiliary passageway, so please don't mind the mess. You look at Wren with her device. Oh, and please no pictures. They're all silent through the whole journey through the unpainted metal service passages. It's not until they're being suited up that they start mumbling among themselves. The initial shock is wearing off, about to be replaced with another emotion. You need it to be trust. You turn to address the group. Matter of fact, encouraging, relaxing, regretful. I'm, yeah, I need it to be trust. It should be matter of fact. Encouraging is nice, but that just, and people can encourage you in a very fake way. You know, it can seem fake. Relax, same. I'm so sorry, you guys. Mm, no. Matter of fact, this is what we're doing. Everyone follow. You gather their attention. Space Joy has multiple facilities intentionally close together. We'll be walking over to another resort to use their shuttle to get you home as quickly as possible. We're on the dark side of the moon, so once we leave the perimeter, we'll be relying on helmet lights. There's plenty of extra oxygen. Myself and several stewards will escort you. They have none. They just look at you, sedated. Do they trust you? Well, they're going along with you, at least. You just hope it holds. James attempts to cut through the gloom by making some crack about lawsuits. You ignore it. 
Lawsuits are probably a reality at this point, but best not to admit it. You give an icy, non-committal smile in reply, but luckily nobody else finds the joke amusing or interesting. You thank the stewards who have just finished suiting you up. Grant approaches you, eyes flitting about nervously. Hey, listen, I'm worried about, <clears throat> well, you know, freaking out again. What if something happens to me out there? What if, what if I don't make it? Hmm. Uh, don't worry, I know you can do it. Uh, don't worry, we're all here. Don't worry, I'll supervise you. Mm. Well, we're all here. It's just going to make him more nervous because he's nervous about the group. Don't worry, I know you can do it. We really can't leave you behind. Yeah, I'll just, yeah. This definitely reassures him. He smiles. Hey, I'm glad to know you've got my back. Who better? Five minutes later and you're leading everyone into the airlock. It's like walking through molasses. There's no buzz of anticipation, no excitement for exploration. They're facing the real unknown this time and it's terrifying. Dread fills the room as air is sucked out of it. You direct everyone to turn on their helmet lights and as you pass the threshold of the field lights, you notice oxygen use spike, then level. They're probably thinking they'd prefer to be on the bright side of the moon, but it's actually much more dangerous. Seeing the looming earth causes vertigo and disorientation. Some people have gotten lost and died just hundreds of yards away from their base doors. The darkness actually helps keep you grounded. Um, energy levels? I don't really know what that means. Uh, verbally check in with everyone. That sounds good. Everyone sounds off, just their name. Nobody seems much in the mood to chat. Out of nowhere, Diana laughs raucously and posits, Wouldn't it be nice if we could just die and respawn back on Earth? Grant seems taken aback at this interjection. What, you mean like in a video game? James laughs, joining in. But that respawn point's too far away, too long of a taxi trip. What are you thinking? Uh, I think you want a teleport button instead. Or how about just a portal? Isn't a respawn just a clone? <laughs> Shut up, you guys! No, no, no. We we want them to feel good. Um, I think you want a teleport button instead. Or just about a portal. One, one of those two. Sadre jumps in. No, I agree with Diana. A respawn would be better. That way, no matter what happened, you would definitely be safe. Andres whips his helmet light around to look at the group. I love how crazy you all are. Ren keeps her beam focused straight ahead while responding. I agree. Respawn. It would be nice to beat death. Um, Then why not just be immortal? James laughs. What makes you think I'm not? Andres pokes fun at him. Well, you going to keep your secret to eternal life to yourself or are you going to share? Um, I would love to be immortal. Or I wouldn't mind just a few hundred extra years. No, I'm just, yeah. Grant sighs. I know what you mean. I think it appeals to everyone. You take a break to cycle through everyone's oxygen and energy levels. Their numbers look good. They're progressing at a better rate than you had hoped. Of course, it helps that the terrain is flat and even, the chatter's doing them good, and you're making good time. Then it appears at the forward edge of your light, a huge crater. It must be new, from the meteoroid storm. You walk up to it, peering down. Estimating by the depth, it must be at least half a kilometer wide, but you can't see the edges from here. You'll have to go around, but you'll lose time, and you have no idea just how much time. Perfect. And of course. Okay, well, I'm surprised, because I really didn't think any of that was real. Um... Detail the new plan. Better Try to scout out a better route before sending them ahead. I do think we need to know about what's going on with everybody's oxygen and everything. Like, how far is it? And let's not go the wrong way. 
when we're dealing with an oxygen situation. Otherwise, I like detail the new plan because like the more that you can give people concrete stuff, uh, I think that's good. Um, these two just are shenanigans. I mean, you know, pretending like it was always here is just lying and don't acknowledge the crater is equally lying. And I just don't want to do any of that. Detail the new plan or try to scout out a better route. I, I think that might be the best option. You turn around and all the helmet lights focus on you. You ignore the glare. This is new. I'm just going to check the route just to make sure that it's safe. There's a small oxygen spike and then it levels out. But the major oxygen drain from this will be the extra waiting time. You discover nothing untoward along the south route, so you lead everyone down that way. They seem to appreciate you being thorough, but their oxygen levels are now much lower than you're comfortable with. Diana's headlamp illuminates down into the crater. Can you even imagine the slow death from falling into that crater, being unable to climb out, sitting down, and just waiting for your oxygen to run out? Or maybe opening your own suit to end it faster. James seems unimpressed. You could totally just jump out. Saudre seems to shiver in her suit. I don't think I'd like to try it. Okay, Diana, head writer, is being <laughs> a little... It's too steep. Don't fall in. Describe rescue procedures. Yeah, I just think any time that we can reassure them that there's procedures and there's training and we've got you covered is always best. It reassures people. Their oxygen use steadily climbs as you describe the electric ladders and digging tools designed to help pull moonwalkers out of craters. They don't seem very reassured by the facts. You check on their resources. One hour, 40 minutes of oxygen left. That's not the best time, but then again, tourists always shamble. Well, I should think an emergency situation. They can move it along a bit. Ren fixates on the crater as well. It looks bottomless from up here. I mean, without the light to see down into it, just this terrifying empty blackness. Andres' voice cracks over the calm. I won't lie. It's scaring the shit out of me. Like, what if something came out of it? Sadri teases him. I think you've worked too much on zombie games. But then it happened. Your feet feel a small tremor of movement and Grant shouts. You flip around and count. One fewer tourist. Everyone's oxygen use goes crazy, yours included. Grant is missing. He must have fallen down. Grant! Um. Talk to Grant. Tell me where you are. You open a private channel. Hey, are you okay? Can you speak to me slowly, calmly? Tell me your name and what's my name. He fights against the shallow, rapid breaths. Yeah, 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 Grant and Trillian. Okay. Uh, check for damage. We don't have a lot of time, you guys. You switch to his readout. You got lucky. The suit's fine and didn't even register any damage. Of course, there is an oxygen use warning, but that's from the hyperventilating. You mentally remind yourself to focus on controlling your own breathing pattern. Andre speaks up for the silent group. Are, are you going to save him? Your mind racks. You obviously need to save him, but the rest of the group shouldn't linger. They'll drain their oxygen while they gawk. Um, okay, well, it seems like I could save him while they keep walking in the direction and we'll catch up. Um, that's not one of my options so since I don't really know what figure this out means maybe if I figure it out that's what I'll come up with <laughs> I don't know as you try to focus on what to do next your brain insists on dwelling on how it went wrong great how it's your responsibility your fault there's not enough time to return with a crane or even a ladder you didn't have the foresight to bring one there's not even any extra oxygen tanks because who didn't even think about that but you're going to have a tourist die on your watch. You will be unhirable, maybe even arrested. Okay. It, it wasn't my fault. We, we're doing the best we can. Just calm down. But of course it was. You were in charge. You should have been better. Andres prods you out of your self-examination spiral. What are you going to do? You steal yourself. You're the best of the best. You're not going to let this get out of hand. Now there's the Trillian on the moon I know. Come back. Come back, Trillian, and be your professional self. Um, 
ask everyone to continue ahead while you take care of this. That's what I think I would do. Radio for equipment in case your rescue attempt fails. Just take care of this right now. I'm going to send everybody else ahead. That was my original plan. The surge of clarifying adrenaline strengthens your voice as you address the group. Okay, people, here's what's going to happen. You all are going to go with the rest of the stewards. Uh, there are stewards with us? We're not alone. Okay, you all are going to go with the rest of the stewards onto the moon base ahead. I will stay behind and rescue Grant. You take a deep breath. Will they trust you? Have you built up enough goodwill that they'll follow your directions? They oblige you. They trust you. It's a surprising relief. One less thing to worry about. Grant has been hyperventilating up into a tizzy of a panic. What if, what if I die out here? A rock's going to tear open my suit when I climb up or I'm going to rip open your suit. It's not going to work. I'm going to die. And I knew this was going to happen. He's probably right. Your brain insists to you. At least one of you is going to die out here and it will be your fault. You fucked this up. Well, I don't think I did. Um... Confidence. Remind him you're there for him. He's already worried about you getting hurt. Ask him to focus. Start reaching down for the rescue. He needs to get control of his breathing. Focus. You take a deep breath and explain it out as calmly as you can. Hey, listen, you're an amazing person and I'm here to get you out of this jam. We're going to get out of it together, but I need you to focus on what I'm saying on when I say it so that we can get you out. His breathing becomes more regular at least, but on the other end of the line, you're only met with sniffles. You grit your teeth. I'm going to reach down, and you're going to grab onto my gloves first. You will then get a solid foothold and reach up for my belt. Another foothold, and then up to my legs, and then you should be able to climb out. Are you ready? The climb won't require much strength with this lessened gravity, but it will require some coordination. There's always the risk of him kicking you and breaking a bone or part of your suit. Grant reaches up for your gloves, then grabs on, but he doesn't move forward. He seems paralyzed, and you notice his breathing rate is actually way too low, almost catatonic. That's scary. Come on, Grant, you urge. Reach up for a foothold next. He lessens his grip. Listen, what if I kill you? What if I knock out your oxygen tube or tear open your suit? Is it worth risking your life for mine? <sighs> that risk is my call to make. And it's my job to protect you. And I care about you. The risk to me is probably not minimal. Grant releases your gloves. Yeah, but see, why can't it be my call? Just because you get paid by one company and I get paid by another? I mean, it makes more sense for you to leave me, for you to go on. Why do you get to sacrifice yourself for me? Why can't I make that choice? Oh, Lord. I didn't even explain why I clicked the last one. It just seemed like the right thing to say. Of just like, shut up, this is what we're doing. I've already come up with a plan. I have decided to take this risk. Just grab my damn glove. Um, but, uh, okay. I got two things here that I can't decide between. Because I'd be fired and arrested, screw that. We're on the moon. We're almost dead. I don't, I don't care. Because if I did die, I'd at least be happy knowing I was somebody helping someone else. That depends on if you know anything after you die, really. So we're here between because I can't just leave you to die knowing I could have done something and because you need saving. Which kind of gets into his point about like, because I want to rescue you. And he's like, yeah, but I want to rescue you. And I'm like, you hang up first. And he's like, no, you hang up first. <laughs> um... Yeah, because I can't just leave you to die knowing I could have done something. Grant gives an exasperated sigh. See, that's what I'm talking about. You think I wouldn't face the same conundrum after killing you, knowing that I could have saved your life if I hadn't been so greedy as to insist that you save mine? He admits tearfully. I'm terrified every day of death, 
of failure, of ending and being unloved. I wish I didn't have to worry about it anymore. Your mouth dries in terror. Grant isn't going to come back up. Then they're going to find a recording of this conversation and a jury is going to convict you of manslaughter for not talking him into just trying to climb up your pack. Your mind flashes to cover up strategies before you shake the thought from your mind. Jesus, Trillian. You suck. Um, I'm more worried about Grant isn't going to come back up and he will die. Uh, uh, I'm really wishing I had said something more personal now of like, but I love you. Uh, girl. But I, I really think he would have turned around and said, well, I love you. And that's why I don't want you to save me. But, uh, I feel like I'm caught in a reality I didn't really want to be in. Okay, so stick it to death by staying alive another day. Sounds good. There are people who want you to stick around. There was one I said earlier, episodes ago, that was very much like that. It was sort of vague, and he took it as very personal, like, I want to see you stick around. Maybe I can save this if he... I just... I don't know. This is Elegy all over. I mean, this is how I w Trillium was feeling about Elegy at the very, very beginning. This is crazy. Grant breathes out a slow stream of air. Well, that's true. There are people who would be sad. He reaches out and pulls on your gloves. Thanks for helping me with that. Sometimes I'm just not sure what's what. He climbs up and over your back. You hold your breath, waiting for a ripping noise, a system failure alarm, something, but nothing happens. And then it's over. You're both fine. The whole experience already starts to fade back into a surreal mist. Whew. I'm glad you're safe. Whew. Grant has already started the trek forward. Yeah, I'm glad too. He retreats within his own mind. You give him space enough to think it over. You've got 30 minutes of oxygen left. That's enough to make it if there are no more emergencies. You keep your breathing deep and steady. Your mind feels almost disconnected from your body as you come down off the panic. It's several minutes before Grant breaks the silence. I just started feeling so tired back there. Like I just wanted to take a break from this hectic life. I mean, not that I wanted to die, just wanted to be able to rest, slow down. Oh yeah, I get it. Uh, I wish I could get a break too. Yeah. Grant stays silent for several meters. Yeah. I mean, life is just so amazing and I feel like I never really get to enjoy it. I'm always so busy, but with what? He crackles the calm with a sigh. I just, I wish I didn't feel so much pressure to get everything done, to always make the most out of life. Hmm. I'm worried about wasting my life. Not something Trillian has really worried about before, apparently, since she took a five-year contract on the moon. We need to focus more on the here and now. Which kind of sounds like, dude, shut up, we're walking on the moon. Let's just walk on the moon. <laughs> Which is not what I mean. I wish there was more time. Yeah, I mean, if there was more time, then we maybe we wouldn't feel so much pressure, right? I don't know, but if, but ugh, I'm overthinking it again. But if we, if there was more time, then we would always be trying to make the most out of that time too. And then, you know, I wish I didn't feel so pressured either. I think we just need to focus more on the here and now of you and me walking in the literal moonlight. You notice Grant stop and tilt his helmet light up towards the sky, the naked infinite universe I think you found it. Our lives are crammed with time fillers, useless distractions. We need to focus more on enjoying the time we do have. 
He pauses. I'm enjoying the time I have with you. You make the rest of the journey in silence, separated by bulky spacesuits and the vacuum of the moon, but it's the closest you've ever felt to another human being. And that seems like an excellent place to start, to stop, rather. Just Trillian and Grant walking on the moon. That's nice. It reminds me of that, of the art. Uh, very early on, one of my friends said to me um, when he saw the art, oh, that's you and Grant sitting on the moon. And I was like, well, I don't know what that is, but that is indeed what it is, I guess. Well, that was uh, exciting. That was really exciting. And we're going to leave it there and pick it up for uh, episode, what are we on? It'll be 13, I guess. Lucky 13. Let's see if we can make it to Moonbase 12. Until then, be well. <laughs>